Thank you for joining us on another episode of Ladder Gay Stories Podcast. I'm your host, Kyle Ashworth, and we have a very special episode for you today. As you can see, we are not in studio. We are on the beautiful island of Maui. And I can tell you, today's episode, grab a couple tissues and sit down. For the next hour, you will be spiritually and emotionally fed. Today's podcast episode is one of a discussion of of deep importance to those who are uh, trying to understand the journey of of a Latter-day Saint who tried his very, very best to do what was absolutely right. It's a story about the miracle of forgiveness. It's a story about Spencer W. Kimball. It's a story about family and friends and associations and how organizations, when combined together, can change the lives of individuals. The Latter Gay Stories podcast is our opportunity to better understand these intersections, the intersection of sexuality and reality, where it meets at LGBTQ Street and LDS Avenue. It's our way of better understanding the lived experiences of the LGBTQ community. Again, we thank you for joining us and thank you for participating in this hour of conversation. People often ask us, how do we best understand and help uh, to promote these stories? And it's simple sharing episodes just like this, commenting on episodes on our social, me- social media channels, help us to expand the reach of these stories and stories just like it. So we invite you to do that. If you are watching on our video version through Facebook or YouTube, we invite you to comment and share this episode. If you are listening to the audio version of this podcast on one of our audio podcast players, we invite you to subscribe to this channel. Now, without further ado, I want to welcome to the podcast a dear friend of mine, and I'm sure a man who will become a friend to you, James Kent. Hi. Welcome. Aloha. Aloha. That is one memory I have of James Kent. (laughs) There's not a single affirmation that I've ever attended that didn't begin with you in the meeting saying, Aloha. Yeah, that was because I was in charge of the memorial moment for like 20 years. (laughs) So, that would be the first thing I would say, brothers and sisters, aloha. And it was so well received. Yes, it was. All these years later, I still remember it. (laughs) So, you're you're making an impression. James, welcome to the podcast. Thank you. Tell us a little bit about yourself and the beautiful island of Maui. This is really unique for us to be able to shoot an episode here and really to be in your your backyard. Well, uh, it's like, where where do I begin? So I'm going to give you a little bit of background about Maui. Uh, Congregationalist missionaries came to the Hawaiian Islands in 1820. The church under, I think, George Q. Cannon came to Hawaii in 1850. The first person he converted, his name was Napella, and he was an ali'i chief. And the minute he joined the LDS church, all of his subjects joined the LDS church. So immediately you had several hundred, you had, uh, you had uh, several hundred members. And so Molly was off to a good start. Uh, unfortunately, his wife contracted uh, leprosy, which is known today as Hansen's disease. And uh, he went before the Board of Health and says, I cannot live without her. So if she has to go to Kalapapa, so must I. And so there he went. And, uh, and interestingly enough, he got Hansen's disease and died before his wife. Uh, the story of Kalapapa is kind of unique to me because my great-grandfather, my mother's uh, grandfather, developed Hansen's disease in 1907. And he was exiled to Kalapapa and where he died in 1912. And of my uh, two granduncles, both of them had Hansen's uh, disease, but in the uh, late 1940s, cell phone drugs were invented, and it arrested the disease, but not the stigma. So one of them returned to Nanakuli, which is part of Oahu, and the other one remained as sheriff on Kalapapa till he died uh, in 1955, my granduncle Jonah. Um, Maui. As I shared with you, my mother was born in a plantation house right off of Kahului uh, Harbor. Uh, her parents had 
converted to the LDS church in, uh, in uh, 1920. And so all the kids at that time, plus children born afterwards, were born under the covenant. And so uh, I'm considered a third generation uh, Latter-day Saint. And several of my cousins served full-time missions. And one of my aunts served a, uh, served a, a, a full-time mission. Um, my mother fell in love with a man who was not a member of the church. And she loved him dearly. But he had problems. He had to deal with schizophrenia. He had to deal with alcoholism. And he had to deal with parents that no matter how hard he tried, he could not live up to their expectations. And he died in 1991 at the age of 56. And it's strange to realize that I'm seven years older than my father. So, I always, I'm very, very proud of the fact when people ask about uh, when and where I was born, says, okay, I was born on January 2nd, 1958, in the then territory of Hawaii. My mother, born in 1936, was in the territory of Hawaii. Her mother, who is Chinese, was born in the Republic of Hawaii. And her father, my grandfather, was born in the Kingdom of Hawaii. My younger brother and younger sister were born in the state of Hawaii. So my point is the history of, of, of Hawaii flows through my family, generation after generation after generation. As your family story unfolded, really so did the history of the island of Hawaii. Exactly. Islands of Hawaii. Exactly, exactly right. Okay. Uh, in the beginning, going all the way back to kindergarten, uh, since my grandfather was president of the Kamehameha Schools, uh, he, was in, he was in the process of retiring at the time, but he made sure that I became a student at Hawaii's largest private school dedicated to children of Hawaiian descent. So that's where I started my journey. And it was, it was a school that went from kindergarten all the way through to 12th grade, all the way through high school. So I'm a little kid, I'm learning how to swim, and I'm in the shower with high school kids. And I'm, I'm noticing something, and I don't know what it is, and I don't understand it. But I noticed that I was different. And as early as the second grade, and as I got older, these feelings began to intensify. Uh, again, I, 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 I didn't understand it. And uh, in 1972, Spencer Kimball writes a letter to a friend. Oh, before that, uh, he wrote, uh, what was his seminal book he wrote in the 1960s? In 1969, The Miracle of Forgiveness. The Miracle of Forgiveness. So I, uh, that was my first introduction to the church's view, uh, you know, the sin against nature. And all of these arguments that he produced, I look back now and they were ridiculous. They were ridiculous and childish and it's like, you should be ashamed of yourself. How old, James, were you in 1969 when that book came out? 1969, I was 11 years old. So you, you remember at 11 years old the multiple descriptors Spencer Kimball yeah. wrote about people like you. Yes. Deviants. Right. 
equal to a murderer. That's right. A malady. Yeah. Diseased. So, I was convinced that I had been possessed by the devil. And the only way to salvation was diving deeper and deeper into the church. And so I became the best little boy in the world. And people would say, oh, James, you're so spiritual. And I would smile and thank you. But deep down inside, I had this terrible secret that I could not tell anybody, nobody could know. By the time I got into high school, my mother realized that her oldest son was gay. And I didn't discover this until I was 32 years old. When she realized that her oldest son was gay, she thought it was her fault. She blamed herself for failing me as a mother. How did she figure that out? She just knew. Now, mind you, you know, she wasn't, she wasn't living in a bubble. Uh, you know, her, uh, one of her closest friends from high school was gay. So being gay was, you know, not a complete shock. She, she personally knew uh, 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 some, uh, some uh, professional, I mean, personally knew people, and uh, of course that was part of the uh, strong-willed mother, weak-willed father myth mythology that some of you may, uh, uh, may uh, become a, a aware of it. So, there, uh, but there I am, deep, deep, deep inside of a closet, just struggling, trying to find out a way to become worthy before God. And in 1980, I made the decision to serve a mission. And I figured that God would send me to Salt Lake City to keep an eye on me. But he didn't. He sent me to Japan. He sent me to the then Japan Okayama mission. Uh, and uh, I look back, no regrets, gratitude in my heart for the experiences that I had. My mission president was native Japanese, and I loved him. His wife was amazing, and he was young. He was like in his, he's pretty young. He was like in his 30s. Uh, I served this successful mission, came home in 1982, uh, uh, and then a year later, I went to Brigham Young University. I want to circle back because you brought sure. up you brought up something that I I want to just spend a little time in because this is where our stories will intersect and yeah. it is first with the miracle of forgiveness yes a book that I also read um, but you also brought up letter to a friend which is a, a pamphlet that the majority of Latter Day Saints have never heard of yes but it was part of my story as well did your story also include Mark Cape, I mean, uh, Elder Packers. Uh, uh, to young uh, men only. To young men only? Is that part of the package? That's part of the package. I think that came out in 1976. And, and you bring a, a good point because the Miracle of Forgiveness did an excellent job at being neither miraculous or forgiving. It was yeah. really damaging for so many who read it who were met at this intersection of sexuality and reality. Letter to a friend made a lot of bold promises that if you served a mission, if you served your callings honorably, if you moved on with your life in terms of marriage and brought a family into this world, these feelings of attraction would go away. To young men only shamed young men for being young men only, yeah. which was interesting. So tell me what you, tell me your experience with letter to a friend, and was that beneficial, beneficial to you at all? No, these were all detrimental to me. And, and uh, Boy K. Packer, uh, 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 to the one, I heard it. I was sitting in the chapel listening to his voice, uh, 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 basically using that sermon, and they turned it, uh, 
they turned it into uh, a pamphlet. Uh, it only created uh, uh, guilt, more guilt, more shame, more feelings of unworthiness. Uh, there was uh, one of my friends, uh, Bishop Stan Roberts, uh, of the San Francisco Singles Ward, uh, made an apology statement regarding miracle of forgiveness. And he says, it is my opinion, and I think he had, he had information to back it up, but I don't have that information, that Spencer Kimball honestly went to ask people, you know, how to deal with the issue, and he had the misfortune of, of, uh, of running into a psychologist from the 1950s. And so Spencer Kimball got information that was already a generation off. Now realize that uh, homosexuality was considered a mental illness until 1973. So you can understand how Kimball would see the information and act on it accordingly. And it also reinforced his prejudices. We do know that in terms of the miracle of forgiveness, uh, his biographer, which is also his grandson, yes. Ed Kimball, said that he regretted many, many parts of the miracle of forgiveness and right. hoped that he, he, if he were to rewrite it again or even decide to write another book, he would have toned it down. Yeah. Um, so I, I think that goes to show how difficult the miracle of forgiveness was for many Latter-day Saints. And I think Kimball heard that. And in uh, 2015, the, the church did quit printing and publishing uh, the miracle of forgiveness. And in their words, they have retired the book uh, from circulation. Is, has Mormon doctrine been retired yet? Mormon doctrine has not yet been retired. Oh, my. Okay. So there I am at BYU. And BYU, of course, boys have to stay with the boys and girls have to stay with the girls, both in the dormitory and off campus. So there I am, surrounded by guys. Did I have a problem? No, I didn't have a problem at, uh, at, at all. And uh, my codependent nature meant that I would be mothering them which meant that if they were having a bad day or a bad time and they just needed somebody to listen, I was there. And if they needed a hug, I was there. And uh, I, I established a lot of close uh, male friendships. None of them, of course, would be sexual. Uh, but those, those were uh, my coping uh, uh, mechanisms. In 1985, I'm getting close to, to graduated from BYU. And what were you studying at BYU? I was studying the Japanese language. And you're still closeted. I'm still closeted. M mother knows. Mother knows, but she's not talking. But no one else. No one else. So finally, uh, I go and see a, a counselor at BYU, and I start talking about these feelings. And... Uh, I start talking about, you know, I found a woman that I really like. And we're, we're pretty, we're pretty uh, compatible. But I have to confess, uh, I don't understand this, but I'm feeling attraction towards my roommate. And of course, he went into this thing is, don't worry, it's just part of your adolescence. It's just a phase you're going through. And all you have to do, Kyle, is get married. And it will happen naturally. And you will be happy. So, shortly after, I turned to, uh, 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 turned to my friend and asked her to marry me. And nine months later, we were married in the Oakland Temple. Now, I have a lot of gay Mormon friend fathers. 
and a good many of them have plenty of children. Some of them have grandchildren. But my little factory refused to work. So there I was, married to a friend, and in my own way I loved her dearly, but I was incapable of consummating the marriage. And within nine months, things started crashing down. Now, I was hell-bent to make it work. My life would be a living hell, but damn it, I'm going to make it work. And my wife did something absolutely incredible, to which I'm grateful for the rest of my life. She left me because I would, not, I would not have left her. She left me, and I was released at the, of the burden. On January 1, 1987, I became single. And did she know? I sat down with her. We were in her green Volkswagen Beetle. And I said, I love you very much. And I really wanted things to work. But the fact is, I'm gay. And her reply is, I know. And I understand. Because when I returned to Provo, there was a young man who came out, and his family turned on him, and his friends turned on him and he was kicked out of his apartment. And he almost committed suicide. And I happened to be there at the right time. And when I saw what he went through, I understood what you went through. And now, all these years later, she's like a sister to me. She should have always been a sister to me. And uh, we're very, very good friends on, we're very, very good friends on, on, on Facebook. Unconditional love. Unconditional love. Now, back in 1978, I met somebody uh, uh, that was to become like a, a brother to me, very, 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 very close. And it's strange, most of my closest friendships, uh, they're not popular people. They're, I don't mean to be insulting, but they're a little off. They see things a little bit differently. And whereas people would be put off by it, it intrigued me. And we, and, uh, and we became friends. Uh, and as a matter of fact, I, you know, I worked at a theater. We would, go, uh, we would go walking late at night, and I confided in him. And he said, you know, says, uh, you're separated from your biological father, and uh, maybe, th uh, maybe that's the issue. Uh, you, you are uh, young enough uh, uh, to question things, and that's okay. And uh, again, this is just a phase. And so he enabled me to go on a mission through his explanation. Now move forward 10 years, the year is 1988. He calls me up and says, James, says, I don't want to insult you, but I've discovered through one of my coworkers an organization called Affinity. And uh, it's an organization for gay and lesbian Mormons. And for curiosity's sake, I th was wondering if you would mind going with me up to San Francisco. And so, now remember, I'm in complete denial. But this is my best friend talking to me. So I said, well, at the very least, I can see for myself what's it all about. So there we are, we drive up into San Francisco's Castro District, 
to the Metropolitan Church on Eureka Street. And as I walked through uh, the doors of the church, uh, there was a storm inside of me. Part of me was saying, turn back, go away, this is your last chance. And the other says, says, find out, you've got to find out. And so we walked up to the second floor, we opened the door, and uh, I asked a question, is this affinity? She says, no, this is affirmation, gay and lesbian woman. Welcome to the group. And I entered into that room. I looked around. 32 men and women in that room. And I realized at the age of 30 that I wasn't alone. You have no idea what that meant for me. And the amazing thing is, they didn't tell me what it meant to be a gay Mormon or what it meant to be gay or what it meant to be Mormon. They just let me come in and just let me be myself. They said, you can listen as much as you want. You can share if you want, says, says, but this is going to be a safe space for you. And so that begins, uh, my journey with Affirmation Gay Lesbian Mormons. That group, most of them, have moved on. But they gave me a gift. And that is, they gave me safe passage out of the closet. And ever since then, I am paying it forward. Every year, I sit down with a new person at the conference and sit and talk and listen. Because I know what it was like being in their shoes. You know, um, a month after uh, going to Affirmation, San Francisco had its Pride Day. And uh, I drove up into the city to blow balloons uh, uh, for the parade. And they said, why don't you come with us? I said, I can't. And they said, OK. And what did I do? I drove back to San Mateo, to the home of my parents. And I got on a kune'e, I don't know what you call them here, sofa. And I curled into a ball and just shivered. The summer of 1988, uh, I had to deal with panic attacks. I'd be driving my car, and immediately I had to pull over because I started weeping uncontrollably and shaking uncontrollably. And uh, my friend Keith, he said, it's all, it's all going to be okay, but I need to tell you something. The person you were pretending to be is dying. And the person who you really are is being born. And both are very, very painful. But it's going to get better. It's going to get better. And it did. It did because the following year, in 1989, I was marching in that parade and I was in charge of the San Francisco Affirmation Contingency. When you walked into that room of 32 yes. in 1978. 1988. 1988. 1988. Yes. And then move forward a couple years later to the point where you were walking in, yeah. in the Pride Parade. Took two years. What was the growth of that organization? Uh, it was kind of interesting. Uh, and uh, it's, something, it's something that I've talked with members of Affirmation over the years. Uh, in my mind's eye, I'm of the old school. And that is, 
The purpose of Elf Affirmation is to provide a safe space for you to resolve your sexual, religious, and spiritual issues. And once you've done that, it's okay to move on. So, uh, there is a constant turnover going on, but there's, there, were, there were a few of us, always a few of us, a core that stayed. Years come, years go, and we're still there. And people come in and come out. I remember uh, my friend Reese, he says, I miss you aff affirmation. And sometimes I wonder whether or not I should go back. And I said, Reese, he says, affirmation helped you. You've moved on. And it's OK. And uh, I know that there's some people that are not going to understand that. You know, They would expect me to try to get them invo uh, uh, involved. But no, to everything there is a season and a time to every purpose under the heaven. I think, I think what you've just described is very honest and a very real situation. The, the point isn't to hold everyone in their pain for a very long time. Um, no. The point is to heal them and, yes. and allow them, give them the tools and resources to right their own ship, to steady their foundation, and to build a very happy, successful, authentic, and what, this is what we often refer to as the, a life of authenticity and honesty. Yeah. It are, it's groups like Affirmation that gives us the, the tools to be able to build those foundations and move on with the rest of our lives. Yeah, but um, the difficulty about being raised LDS is that you have been ingrained with authority figures above you telling you what to do and how to live your life. And when you come out, there's nobody there to tell you. You're on your own. And it's like the difficulty that I had to deal with with newer, newer members of Affirmation, they wanted me to tell them what to do. And I says, I can't. Says, you have to find out on your own what is right to you. You know, <clears throat> whether you decide to be celibate or go to the bathhouse or going to, an, uh, uh, to go into an opposite sex marriage, these choices are all, you, all yours, and not only are they all yours, it's okay to make mistakes. Okay? It's okay to make mistakes. Something doesn't work, try something else. And all these years later, I don't think I've changed my philosophy much, much in that area. So in 1988, just following this chronology, 1988, you're divorced. Yes. You've left BYU, graduated BYU. Yep. You were married. You... Uh, listen, no, I was, remember, I was divorced in 1987. I discovered affirmation in 1988. In 1990, I'm giving a membership spotlight. And I'm dressed in my ceremonial Japanese kimono. And... I look at my friend Doug and said, this is the closest you'll see me in drag. And Doug looks at me and he smiles. We'll see about that, honey. So move forward to September of 1990. Doug calls me up and says, come over to my place. I'm going to fix you dinner and then I want you to experience something. He was a master chef. He was, he, was, he was good at whatever he did. Very, very good. He says, sit down in this chair. And these powders and paints and rouge and eyeliner and lipstick and all, all, of, all of that. And he would not allow me to see myself in the mirror. And then he, he puts his wig on and he says, okay. Go look in the mirror. And my sister Mary was staring back at me. Oh my gosh. This is unbelievable. This is good. Because next month is our Halloween party. And guess what you're wearing? Mary. 
So I'm wearing my sister. <laughs> yes. So uh, I started. I started practicing. By uh, I got a I got a pair of uh, black high heels, so that I could adjust my feet to wearing uh, high heels. I was like, should I share this or not? Why not? So one Sunday, I'm getting ready to go to church. This is the San Francisco Singles Ward. I open up my closet, pull up um, my dress, uh, dress shirt, tie, coat, slacks. And I look down, and I'm about to reach for my Red Wings. But my eyes see those black high heels in front of my Red Wings. And I think to myself, just last Sunday, our stake president talked about accepting people as is. And I put on a pair of black high heels and went to church. And uh, the church was uh, uh, the building in Sunset. And I, I walk in, greeted everybody, and uh, Nobody seemed to notice that I was a couple of inches taller. Nobody noticed. And uh, so, and of course, the first thing was choir practice. And the uh, choir director, uh, he was family. And so I, I said, hey, Larry. What? And his eyes turned into half moons. And it's like, oh my gosh. And I says, this is just a little test. Don't worry about it. Well, right next to me was my, was, I, I'm not going to give his name. Uh, but he went into the ex gay, he, he was into uh, Evergreen and Exodus. He was part of the ex gay movement. And so at that point, uh, he is not a homosexual anymore. Just a just viewer context. Evergreen and Exodus both yeah. pushed re, uh, re, uh, reparative, reparative therapy, therapy exactly. conversion therapy programs, and conversion therapy uh, 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 programs. So pray the gay away. So he's sitting next to me, and it's like, did God do this or not? His pencil falls out of his choir book, and he's reaching down to get it. And he just can't get it. He's just an inch or two away. Humph. He gets up, turns around, picks up his pencil, and then he sees my shoes. And I swear, Kyle, this is what he did. <gasps> and he falls on the grand piano. And then he starts laughing. And then it gets quiet. Now, mind you, the choir is already there, sitting down. And he said, take those shoes off. I says, I can't. Take those shoes off. I can't. So he called down the powers of heaven against me and ran downstairs and tattled to the bishop, James. You know, uh, 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 bishop, uh, bishop Wade. James is wearing high heels. So we go through the choir music. We have Sunday school. And the Elders Quorum president, bless his heart. And I loved him dearly. He had the saddest look on his face and said in a very, very quiet voice, the bishop would like to see you. So... I took those heels off because I was not going to about to walk downstairs. So I have my heels in my hand. I have my scriptures in the other hand. I walk down, and uh, Bishop Wade says, "Before we begin, I'd like to offer a prayer." And so he, he gives a nice prayer. He gives a nice uh, a nice prayer because he didn't he did not want this to get into a fighting match or anything at at, at all. And there was a piece of him that was trying to understand because he knew that half of his elders quorum 
was gay. He knew that. Okay? So he offered a prayer. And then I grabbed the shoes, slammed them on his desk, and said, what difference does it make? He said, you are insulting and demeaning your priesthood. Are you telling me that women are inferior to men? I didn't say that. Then please tell me what you said. And we went back and forth for two hours. Two hours back and forth. And at the end of that time, he said, James, Lee the man is angry at you. But Bishop Wade has to be impartial. I'm going to talk to the stake president. And if he doesn't have a problem with you wearing high heels, you can wear them any Sunday, every Sunday to church. Well, needless to say, I never wore them again in church. I never wore them again. Curious if he spoke but, to the, high pre uh, the stake president you know and what? if he I don't, got back with I you. I don't know. He never, he, never got, uh, he never got back to me. But anyway, <clears throat> following Sunday, <clears throat> I'm with my friends. We're talking. And Bishop Wade comes right up to me, smiles and shakes my hand and says, Hey, cha-cha, how you doing? And my, my friends, they lost it. They lost it. But that is the end of my short story of the day I wore high heels to church. And, and it I, was all downhill from there. Well, the first time uh, my friend uh, uh, dressed me up, it was an affirmation Halloween party, and... Uh, he was such an incredible makeup artist that when I entered into uh, the church, and they had a big social room, people had no idea who I was. I mean, the illusion was absolutely astounding. And then they realized who I was. Uh, and, uh, and then uh, we had to share a talent. So you, you can imagine me in the role of a big, Samoan, Samoan goddess named Imelda singing Hello Young Lovers in my baritone voice. And I won first prize. <laughs> but I was hooked. So from time to time, we would dress up. Uh, and uh, we would have a wonderful uh, night out, night, night out uh, on the town. town uh, and uh, there are other memories, but I'm not too comfortable sharing them right now. Uh, in 1992, Doug got sick. He wound up in the hospital. And when I found out, I drove to the hospital. And there he was, struggling for breath. And the doctor comes up and says, Are you his lover? And I said, No, I'm his sister. <laughs> and Doug turned to me and said, You bitch. So he's coughing and laughing at the same time. It wouldn't take too long to realize that my best friend was HIV positive. And back then, it was a death sentence. Most people back then had 18 months to live. And Doug was no different. Now, in 1993, I made the decision to move to the uh, East Coast. I deliberately got a... Uh, two-bedroom apartment uh, with the belief that as soon as you get better, you're going to come stay with me and I'm going to take care of you. But uh, 
that was not to be. Two weeks later, on July 25, 1993, I lost my best friend. After 27 years, I still miss him. I still dream about him. And I hope someday that I'm going to be able to see him again. The hardest thing about coming out was watching people die. I came out in the middle of the AIDS pandemic. I lost dozens of friends. I knew people who lost hundreds of friends. A whole generation from 1950 to 1965 wiped out, erased, and nobody wanted to talk about it. So I move on. I become involved with uh, the Washington, D.C. chapter and the New York chapter. Of affirmation. Of affirmation. Now each, now, each journey is like over 100 miles. It's 150 miles to Washington, D.C. and about 110 miles into, uh, into New York City. So let's, let's move forward. The year is 1995. I'm attending the Seattle Conference at St. Joseph University. I particularly liked that conference because we were in dormitories, and as a result, we gathered together in informal groups, and that's where the magic happens. Keynote speakers and workshops are nice, but they don't compare to one-on-one -on -one open sharing. Nothing compares to that. Anyway, it's Sunday, we just had our banquet luncheon, and I had to get to the uh, airport so that I could fly back to Philadelphia. So I grab my, my suitcases, I give my hugs, say goodbye to everybody. Hey, do you know who Paul Mortensen is? Yes. Paul comes running out into the foyer and says, James, you can't go. Why? I can't tell you, but you can't go. Says, says, get back into the banquet area. Says, if I have to drive you there myself, I'll drive you. So I sit back, and uh, it was time to announce the winners of the Paul Martinson Award. And so several familiar names uh, 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 came up, and it's like, I don't have a clue why I'm here. My name wasn't even mentioned. And then uh, Terry uh, gets up, and she and her, her wife uh, received the Mortensen Award the year before. And so they are talking about this person. And then all of a sudden, they're talking about Philadelphia. And it's like, what? And then they say, I want to welcome Affirmation's premier drag queen is the recipient of the Paul Mortensen Award. And there I was, in a sea of people applauding me. And I had only been a member at that time for seven years. I says, Paul, why did you select me? And he says, James, I'm going to give you an honest answer. I didn't select you. But I know who did. And I respect her. And when she, made you, when she selected you, he says, yep, we're going to go for it. And so I, have, I joined a group of incredible people that, uh, that we, uh, we belong now. Some, uh, some of them have died. Some of them have moved on. But it's, it's an absolutely amazing uh, list of, of, of people, and that remains one of my uh, one of my fondest memories. So, for the listeners who are unaware of the Affirmation Mortensen Award, that's given away each year at the Affirmation Conference, and it's it is a, an award bestowed upon an individual who makes a positive difference 
to the LGBTQ community? Well, specifically to the uh, affirmation gay and lesbian Mormons. Uh, uh, in hindsight, I, I realized what helped it along. When I first came to Philadelphia, I'm cut off from my family and friends. So I began writing out a newsletter, a paper newsletter, that starts with 30 people and then expands to 300. And I'm publishing this newsletter every four to six weeks. And uh, it acted as a safety net so you would get that in the mail, and because I was drawing things from all over. Uh, and uh, when I uh, returned to San Francisco in 1998, it went, uh, it went electronic. And then, uh, and then in 2011, I joined Facebook. And I could not do th the two of them, and so I made the decision that I'm going to continue doing my newsletter, but I'm going to do it in Facebook format. So here I am, nine years later, with 5,000 friends, and it's an amazing uh, uh, journey because I still continue to help people out. I still uh, continue to, to nurture. I still continue to, to get my friends to laugh. And, and, uh, and it's great, great to be able to do that. When Affirmation uh, celebrated its 40th uh, anniversary, the nice thing is that we had people from all different time periods there. Uh, but there was, a, there was a sad realization that with the, ex with the exception of the presenters there, I could look out on a sea of 600 people and only two would go back to 1988. Everybody else came in at different times. And so perhaps you understand why I do the memorial moment because my memory is a collection of all these years and all these people. Um, and uh, sometimes it gets really moving. In the year 2017, when I did the memorial moment, as I was reading the names, I read Stockton Powers. And one third of the audience stood up. It's like, oh my gosh. That boy had no idea what an impact he had on other people. And it makes it only sadder. So I'm grateful uh, uh, to do that. It gives me a chance uh, to remember some amazing people. It gives people a chance. I said, you know, they don't have to be gay. They don't have to be Mormon. It says, share, share a name of somebody that made a significant change to your life for the better. It could be a grandparent. It could be a, a close friend from high school. doesn't matter. And so I think each year it gives it value as people who have forgotten their loved ones that they could stand up and remember them. So. Uh, that's very, very important. Now, I felt, I, I felt uh, bad in, uh, in 2019, uh, Willie uh, stood up and did the memorial moment for me. And then in 2020, they were hoping that I would get onto Zoom uh, to do the memorial moment, but uh, Murphy's Law, I developed a uh, staph infection. I had to go into the hospital and it was like there was nothing I could do about that. And uh, this year, I'm hoping that I will uh, at least get to Salt Lake City and find somebody there that can show me how to participate uh, through Zoom 
so that uh, I can keep the tradition going until we until we gather again. I want to I want to go in just to the last part of this interview. Sure. I want to jump in two separate directions. Fine. The first direction I want to go in is I just want to make a full circle in terms of your heritage. And I want to talk a little bit about this topic in relation to Hawaiian tradition. Um, and and what, what were Native Hawaiians, how, how did they approach this topic, the topic of sexuality and gender identity? I want to talk a little bit about that because I think historically we're finding things interesting in, in latter-day journals that talk a little bit about this space. So I want to just discuss that given that we have a resident Hawaiian and we're here on the beautiful island of Maui in a very unique situation to be able to, to talk about this topic. Uh, Pre-European contact Hawaii. That means before 1778. There were no marriages. It was common law. Two people came together and they formed a family. Uh, when, uh, when the whalers uh, arrived, uh, some of the women uh, wanted exotic children. And so their husbands would say, go. And they would get pregnant by a sailor. And when that child was born, the father was the Hawaiian. That child was raised as 100% Hawaiian. Because once you, once you Hanai, adopt in all rights and privileges uh, and responsibilities uh, 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 come with it. Now, in pre-European pre uh, contact Hawaii, you had two groups of people. One was the Mahu, and the other was the Ikane. Mahu. I was raised in Hawaii in the 1960s, but that was a derogatory word. Basically, the definition is a man who acts like a woman and dresses like a woman. Mahu were revered in old Hawaii because they were like the Native American Burdash, Wingte, Medicine Man, Shaman. They were the healers and the teachers, and they were given great respect until the Congregationalist missionaries converted everybody to Christianity and said, that's sinful, that's disgusting, and made a mockery of it. And uh, a few years ago, I was at a, a funeral of a relative of mine, and uh, the minister, who was part Hawaiian, uh, decided to share a joke. Uh, and he mentioned the word mahu, and you could see he was giggling, he thought it was funny, and it's like, I was so pissed. I turn over to my cousin and says, it's a good thing you're sitting next to me because I would have stand up and told him off for disrespecting our culture. Says, says so the term mahu is very, very misunderstood. Uh, it's been, it's been uh, culturally appropriated as, uh, as uh, somebody uh, who uh, either cross-dresses or is transgender. Now, in ancient Hawaii, the roles of male and female were quite divided. But whether or not you were male or female, if you chose the female role, good. There you go. You chose the male road, uh, road there you go. Okay, so you can see their viewpoint towards gender uh, is completely different from, from what uh, most of us understand. Now let's move on to the word iconic. 
Uh, it's interesting. Uh, I was reading an English translation based on the legends of the youngest daughter of, of the fire goddess, Pele. And the translator said, as much as I want to, there are some words I cannot translate into the English language. There is no, there's no match for it. And one of them is iconic. How do you describe a relationship? Confidant? Brotherly? Unconditional love? The list goes on and on and on. There is no English equivalent for iconic. Now, in the 20th century, they said, oh, it just means friendship. No, it means much more than friendship. And again, it's frustrating to see such a beautiful word watered down to something that's essentially meaningless when you realize the great, rich tradition of the iconic. Now, uh, uh, the iconic could be male or female, and, and the person who has the icon could be male or female. So again, uh, issues of gender are, 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 are non-issues, and these icon were very, very smart. They could warn the ali'i of what those, uh, those foreigners are trying to do. And people would add in, those, in their journals, those damn icones, <laughs> they can read our minds. <laughs> Is they're writing to, is they're writing in uh, into the, the journals, and of course, iconic, without skipping a heartbeat, they would die, for the person that they were uh, they were in, entrusted to. So that gives you a little bit of background of Mahu, and iconic. The reason why I brought that section up was I found in Joseph F. Smith, his journal the discussion he had with John Taylor, president of the church at the time, his son Bruce, who confessed that he was gay in an interview with uh, Joseph Smith, Joseph F. Smith, the prophet, or the, uh, at that point, an apostle, eventually to become the prophet of the church. And Joseph F. Smith wrote, writes in his journal that Bruce Taylor, the son of the then prophet, was a Kane. And I think that was interesting because shortly after that, they escorted him out of Salt Lake and he moved to the Seattle area where he would never marry, never return to the church and essentially was ostracized from the Mormon community in Salt Lake. Joseph S. Smith served a mission to the Sandwich Islands and he had an iconic. He should have known better. I think it's interesting to bring up and have this discussion because most people will pass that writing in his journal over, not fully understanding. Joseph F. Smith served his mission in these islands. Right. He knew that language. He also knew the meaning behind that. And that's, that's really why I wanted to, to better understand yeah. for our listeners and those who will read that section in his journal what, what Akane meant. Yeah, and I'm, I'm not sure whether or not his icon returned to Salt Lake City with him or whether or not he remained uh, 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 in the Hawaiian Islands. Uh, I don't even know how to find out because there are a lot of people that don't want to talk about it. This history is deep. <laughs> All right, the last part of the podcast. All righty. I want to talk, I want you to talk specifically to church leaders who are listening to this, or even parents, of children that might just be coming out. What is your advice to church leaders and parents to better navigate this journey? What, what would your advice be to them based on your years and years of experience in meeting with people and hearing their stories? I apologize, but I, this is my way of responding. 
It might not be very kind. I trusted you. I believed you. I gave my life to you. And you betrayed me. said, I left the church in 1998. I've been out 23 years. And there's no chance that I'm going to go back because you have made it very, very clear that LGBTQA are not welcome. And at the worst, they are defective. You've learned nothing. People are leaving the church in droves and you learn nothing except hide behind the pulpit and think that your opinion is the will of God. The church is going to continue in spite of you, not because of you. And it's going to continue because of the faithful members of the church that put love ahead above all else, that reach out with compassion. That is what's going to save the church, not your pontification. And sometimes I miss, I miss going back. But it keeps happening over and over and over again. You can't hide from your history. You covered it up, and now it's coming to light. And you know, sometimes you even wonder, if you admit that you made a mistake, maybe people would be more understanding. But you don't. You don't admit his mistakes. You don't apologize. And then, why, are, why is everybody leaving? But the most important person that you not need to get approval of is yourself. You have to accept yourself as is, irregardless of anyone else around you. Just simply be yourself. And if you need to lean, uh, and if you need a shoulder to lean on, mine's always available. Okay. I love it. Thank you. Thank you for sharing your stories. Thank you for decades of service to the LGBTQ community, adjacent to and in Mormonism. I'm confident that the, the intersection of LDS Street and LGBTQ Avenue is far better because of you and your contributions to our community. And I'm grateful for the opportunity to be able to, to share in this last hour of that experience. I, I thank you. And again, I'm, su I'm surprised that uh, my story uh, was, uh, was in of interest and of value. Uh, uh, to you. One of these days I'd like to hear your story. We'll do it. Is there anything that you wanted to talk about that we didn't touch? There are so many things, but there's just not enough time. Uh, so I would say, I would say come to the next Affirmation Conference and uh, we'll do some more uh, sharing. James Kent, thank yeah. you. You're very welcome. This has been another episode of Latter-day Stories podcast. We are thankful that you joined us for this hour to better understand James's story and to understand the experiences of the LGBTQ community. People often ask us how to best help and support the Latter-day Stories podcast, share episodes just like this. I hope that you were touched and you felt the meaning of, of this message as I did. To know the history behind the LGBTQ movement within the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints, the, the progress that has been made in this space, but most importantly, the genuine stories and experiences of those impacted by this topic. 
Again, we thank you for joining us on this episode, this special episode as we broadcast and, and record this in the beautiful uh, island of Maui. Again, thank you. And it's stories like yours and James James's story that helps us to continue writing our own Latter-day Stories. <laughs>